If you have your copy of God's Word, as you heard, the two chapters we are studying this morning is Exodus 26 and 27 in its entirety. And um, yeah, that was that's a lot. It is. Uh, Pastor Stephen had joked that the, the reading might be longer than the sermon. Um, it will not be, but yes, it was long. But how do we make sense of all that? Well, I want us to approach this text with, with a word that we use in English. The word is heavenly. We sat and thought about what that word actually means. It's a word that we just toss out so casually nowadays. It's this hammock is heavenly. This German chocolate cake is heavenly. This sunset is heavenly. We want heaven to touch earth in some way. We want something from earth, from heaven to earth. We want to be able to touch and know and see and say, that is heavenly. So we start picking things up and we use in our English language the word heavenly. We were created to seek for and to find pleasure in God. Yet in our corrupted minds and our corrupted hearts, we manufacture places and thoughts of meeting with God and saying, heavenly. And the medieval church made up relics to meet with the divine for answers to their pain and mercy for their needs. Hindus meet with their gods as statues and niches on the walls of their homes. Buddhists get in touch with the divine if and only if they can turn off their minds and their hearts and have no passion. Muslims believe God to be so perfect that no provisions can be made to actually meet with him. He is too distant. So we use the word heavenly, a heavenly place, a heavenly place that's not just lovely, but it is where God is now on earth to meet with people. If a, if a place on earth is heavenly, it cannot be made of our imagined or, our, uh, or imagined by earthly people. I can't come up and say, well, I think this is what it should look like. This, is, this needs to include this. These elements need to be included in order for this to be really and truly heavenly. No, it cannot be imagined by us. It cannot be manufactured by us. Such a place of meeting must be revealed perfectly from our perfect and our speaking God. We do the listening. We do the approaching. He, and we know, as Paul told Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. These two chapters are profitable. The details in the passage we study this morning has deep eternal weight and meaning. So approach these with me um, with this in mind but we need the Lord's help so let us pray to the Father Heavenly Father we thank you for this time we thank you for your word which is how you reveal yourself to us left to uh, our own we will imagine a meeting place with you we will imagine you we will make you up and paint you imperfectly but Lord you reveal your perfect self through your perfect word, and we humbly submit now. We come with ears open. We come hungry. Lord, you have commanded us to enter your courts with thanksgiving, and yet here we are fleshly. No amount of thanksgiving in this flesh is perfect. Lord, we ask for your help. We ask for your mercy that we truly do come before you thankful and humble, not just lowly, but lowly before a majestic God you reveal yourself and how we meet with you though we are sinful and though you are holy how do we come and meet with god in this heavenly place so lord we ask that you would help us we thank you for your word and we ask for your mercies but we know your mercies only come by the authority of jesus name in whose name we pray amen the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that is hidden in a field which a man found, and then he covered it up again. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. In his joy, Jesus said, joyfully loses everything to buy and enjoy a simple field. Why? Because it had great hidden treasure. You see, the arrangement 
the place, the ritual to meet with God is more than the objects that seem simple. Sharing traits of other ancient religions. Bronze this, silver clasp, bronze that, gold hammered this. There's all well, the, what is all of this? Our God, who is a God of order, has ordered the tabernacle and the complex to be fashioned in a way to strike awe in the heart of the approaching worshiper. This is more than, well, I'm going to, I just want to study the details. And, well, it's really fascinating. I wonder what it is. The meaning is more than just, well, knowing it. The meaning is there is awe that strikes the heart of the one who's approaching dearly to worship God in this heavenly place. God's grace means all of the perfection required to meet with him, Christ has fulfilled with perfect obedience as well as a perfect sacrifice on the altar of the Lord. But his grace is more than fulfilling what's between us. It's more than just the space that's between God and us. He invites us to enjoy him in this heavenly place. To treasure God. Not just to know the kingdom of heaven. Not just to now know and outline the truths of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says it's like treasure in, hidden in a field. This is something delightful beyond the, our wildest expectations of the most joyous occasion we've ever had on earth. To know and to belong to. To be invited into the kingdom of heaven. Into the presence of God. As an approaching worshiper. Oh, Jesus said, this is treasure. Uh, God's grace to, means that what, that what is held between God and sinful man, God has accomplished through Jesus Christ. And he invites us in, get this, to treasure. To the great heavenly treasure that is far better treasure than all the earth, which Jesus spoke of, is God himself. So we have this in mind as we approach this. Let's remember our God's holiness as well as grace as we study the tabernacle and the veil, the courtyard, and the altar. First, the tabernacle and veil. This place to meet with God was no ordinary tent. If you would have looked around the camp of the Hebrews, you see lots of little tents, lots of little things set up. Right in the center of it would have been this massive complex. It's not an ordinary tent. This is more than just appearances, though. What makes this extraordinary is this. This is where God dwells with his people. Right in their midst, camping with them, moving with them. He will be their God, and they will be his people. The place heaven vi visits earth in the tabernacle presence of God, right here in this complex. No ordinary tent. The king of heaven will be the king of the Hebrews and dwell in their midst. The Hebrew word translated as tabernacle is actually derived from the root word to dwell. It's almost repeating itself. God will dwell in the dwelling place. It's the tabernacle. So the dwelling place is where God lives. Just can you wrap your mind around that? You look around at all these tents. Well, what's with the uh, giant tent there in the center with the big complex? That's where God is comes from heaven to earth to be with us, that we can approach him. So, the, yes, the living God lives with his people in this rather extraordinary complex. This, the precision of measurements, the ornamentation symbolizes God's holiness, yet in his great compassion, it is the place sinners come to meet with God. In the midst of this complex, with bread on a table, a lampstand, ark at the center, it's the most holy place. There's a holy place, and then you enter into the most holy, or holy of holies. This is the inside surrounded by ten sheets of fabric sewn together in sets of five to make two large curtains joined by 50 golden couplings. This is a big thing, very ornamental. Draped over it all is fine white linen adorned with blue, purple, and scarlet yarns. A royal covering with royal colors, as found in many ancient throne rooms that the Middle Eastern world would have known. Artists were commanded by God to embroider 
cherubim into the fabric surrounding the most holy place. So cherubim is not just found above the mercy seat of the ark. You would have seen them before you would have even entered the space. This is holy ground. So, so we see these, again, these guardians of the throne of God guarding us from his holiness. A second layer of this tent was a bit more nomadic, traditional. You might pick up on it, just in the perusing, just a little elementary reading of it. Goat hair, again, nomads. It's something that the, if you go in the Middle East now and meet up with nomads, they still use this today. Have a heavy covering. It is a tough fabric. It's able to endure the brutal weather, the brutal winds that are found in the desert wilderness. Uh, so wool and linen lined it, which blocks any view from an outsider of the inside of this most holy place. So you don't get the, your eyes do not get to see. You cannot see God. No one has seen God. Rome and, or sorry, ram and, and goat skin finish the layers to make it very tough. It's got a very heavy covering. Again, with the acacia wood poles, they're set, uh, used to set up and break down the tabernacle complex as the Hebrews traveled through the wilderness. This whole complex was to be able to be broken down, rolled up, the poles we carried up, and now we're on again. Moving again. Then we set up camp again. And what are we going to do? Set the camp up again around this tabernacle complex. When I was young, and I, con I honestly, I've tried to remember um, why I was even watching this, but I was quite young. Watching the circus that came into Louisville, where my hometown, and uh, they were down at the uh, fairgrounds. And I, for some reason, was sitting there watching them bre break it down. And if you've never seen this, this is a quite a. a, a a spectacle to behold. I mean, this is teams of people with some machinery, but it's mostly people. And they're taking these huge poles down. And you just watch them rolling up the tent and picking up the poles and putting them on the back of trucks. It's a fascinating thing to watch. Only for them to go to the next town. And well, you know what they're going to do there? And put it back up. And when that week is over, tear it back down. It's, it's an exhausting thing. But it's something that's done. You can imagine this here in the wilderness where it's time to get up in the morning. It's time to go again. They roll it up. They put it up to the acacia wood poles and they start walking. Walking as the, the tabernacle there with them. God's presence with his people. There was a limited access to the holy presence of God. He travels with his people through this wilderness road home, but peering eyes could not gaze upon his dwelling place. Yes, I have confidence for the presence of God is with us, but his glory I have not behold. The closed-off tabernacle by veil was torn at Christ's atoning death on the cross. What they could not behold, we do in the face of Jesus Christ. The mere backside glory of God, which Moses will see in chapter 34, is now in the radiance of Christ, as Hebrews tells us. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, as Paul tells us in this letter, the second letter to the Corinthians. So we understand this, the tabernacle and veil. But let's move to the court. I know that's going forward to come back, but we got to know, I wanted you to see this, uh, this complex for what it is. The courtyard, or the court. This has royal, vibrant colors of fabric. You can tell it's a royal court. The throne room, as Yahweh is enthroned between the cherubim, and, and the one entering the space must enter through royal fabrics with cherubim guards embroidered on them. Twenty pillars line the walk of the worshiper towards God's throne, which is in the Holy of Holies. Remember, these things are but copies of heavenly things. God is telling him something of what is it like in your heavenly throne room. Well, I'm going to tell you precise measurements and what things should look like. God's heavenly throne now touches, that, that is from heaven, touches earth in this royal court where sinners approach an eternal throne which rules the heavens and the earth with no boundaries. And I want to read um, Psalm 1 and 22 because I'd like this to pop up and I want you to hear it from God's word and not just me in poetic language. 
Psalm 122. It's one of the songs of the ascent. So you remember, people are coming to worship God. They're approaching God. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This is the worshipers gathering. Could you pluck out there verse 5, though? What's at the center of this? Where are they going? They are approaching the thrones of judgment. Where they're fixed, they're set. The thrones of the house of David. So in 1 Kings 7, 7, we read when Solomon built the house of the Lord, it has a hall of justice there, and there is a throne of judgment. In Psalm 89, verse 29, God promised, I will establish David's line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. Isaiah records God's promise of God, David's everlasting throne to David's son, having a rule or an increase in government that will have no end. And with that increase of his rule, of his government, there's a peace that has no end. So this peace of Jerusalem is within the walls. This is within the walls of the one who is to come, Christ, and those who enter in. Peace be with you. Yet for these wilderness Hebrews, and an upcoming in the promised land, there is this space was here on earth in this tabernacle complex. This tabernacle, an upcoming temple, had jaw-dropping architecture, filling each worshiper with awe before God. When I teach uh, church history, I like to go through what uh, the history of architecture and art that goes through our spiritual forefathers. How they saw awe-inspiring artwork as we entered into worship. Even in the ancient, the, the early church, when we were hiding in Roman sewers, we entered in archways. He saw artwork on both sides. Jesus' teaching, Jesus' work on the cross, who he is, what he has done. And it was supposed to spark awe. Oh, he's a majestic God. He's a compassionate God of mercy. And we see all this as we go and enter together and to worship Christ together. Modern architecture, as we've gone through the ages, has kind of lost some things along the wayside. In the medieval church, if you walk in, you're walking these massive doors higher than the ceiling. And what is it higher than that when you walk in? The cathedral itself. It's way up. And you, if you've ever been into such a large cathedral, you look up and you're like, I am a tiny person. Just tiny in this building. Imagine the tabernacle of God is the heavens. I'm standing on a tiny rock orbiting a medium-sized star in this vast universe, and God is omnipresent. And he has the authority and power to uphold all these planets and all these stars, and here I am, this insignificant person approaching God. So we had this understanding of how to approach him. In modern architecture, we've kind of lost a little bit of it. We've gone to simpler, and now... We are going to, well, simply verbally tell you how do we approach God. I like this room. I do. I remember the first time I saw it. I was like, this, this is extraordinary. A high ceiling. You get this uh, beauty of the modern stained glass windows. And what is on there? The crosses. And at the center, the big cross. I, I, my eyes are drawn to that, but not, not solely. When you enter into this room, what is at the center of our attention? Hope. Why? We have to hold. This is, this is where we meet God. He speaks to us. Not physically. This is just wood. It's nothing. It's upholding the scripture. How, how do we come and meet with God? How do we come to hear God? He speaks to me through his scripture. It's a lovely, quiet place to pray in this room. Especially during the week when there's 
no way, I turn, keep the lights off, the sunlight comes through these windows, and it just, I mean, just gracefully touches the tops of all the pews. It's lovely. Um, when I come here to pray for each one of you, I can still see you where you're seated, usually right now, same spots. Uh, it's, it, I, I come in and I see it's just a building, it's just a space, sure. It's a space where we gather, though. It's like our living room. It's like, this is where we sit together. This is where we gather together. We worship Christ together. Sure, it might be ordinary to the world, but something extraordinary is happening here. Heaven has come down in Christ. Christ the Word. I mean, we're approaching God, and He speaks to us. And, and all the condemnation that belongs to sinners like us has been put on Christ so we can enter in and not just know the kingdom of heaven, but to find it as a treasure hidden in a field. This is, that's truly the meaning of the word heavenly. Um, so yet, I confess, however, that, and I'm sure I'm not alone, this room gets familiar. The first time I came in here, this, place, this entire complex looked massive. And, you know, sometimes I'm reminded just how big this building is when air conditioners go out and things like that, or roofs have to be replaced. But, you know, it, it becomes familiar, and familiarity makes it the space feel smaller. And then, then you just kind of walk past things that I was, you know, really, wow, oh, that's really something when I first saw it. Now I just walk past it like it's just familiar it's just part of it i wonder if the tabernacle and temple just became part of the scenery to some became an expectation you see them the levites bringing it down carrying the acacia wood poles i see this every day 40 years i see this all the time it's no big deal it's just familiar It's, it's something to be expected it's just who we are as a people like a newly constructed skyscraper once filled people with awe when they came by, surrounded by others, and then all of a sudden, over time and generations, becomes familiar, expected, just another little place on the skyline of a city. Uh, have you lost sense of awe coming to church? I mean, it becomes familiar, it becomes expected. It's just like, you know, it's a ritual I do. I check it off on Sunday and be honest with you, I, I look more forward to noon than I do 11 a.m. How about prayer? Sure, you might have the, the habitual, and it's a good habit. I pray often. But when, you know, when I was first saved, my prayer life was just deep and weighty. And I didn't say as much profound things as I do now because thanks to theological education and a lot of well-read. But, you know, I, it's become familiar. I just walk right past the bronze altar, right through the 20 pillars, and it's just familiar. And it'll be broken down tomorrow. We'll be carrying on to the next village or town or whatever, right through the desert wilderness. How about singing? Something we can take for granted. Singing in church. You would say, well, you know, I know the lyrics. I know the song. I know the beat. Yeah, and to the point where, you know, my vocal cords, I can sing it loud and I can sing it proud. But you know what? I just kind of walk right into that hymn. There's no, it's, there's, there's almost this kind of empty space of feeling. It's just become familiar. Has worship become methodical, familiar, casual, expected ritual to you? Just losing that sense of all you had when God's grace first taught your heart to fear, as John Newton said. I don't think the cure is architecture. You know, because if the answer is God could just burn this whole building down, Lord, I hope not, but psh, worship is still commanded of me and expected. So it's not the building, it's not the architecture, it's not the things, it's not the trappings. The problem with my malaise and my heart isn't outside of me. Ask God. Lord, I desire to be overwhelmed with all of your might and your compassion again. Remind me of who you are and who I am before you. Remind me of your mighty works that I may sing of today. Revive us again. Awaken my heart to love you, Lord. He will answer that prayer.
prayer. He has for me over and over again. I think rightly understanding the bronze altar, that is theology from the word of God and what the altar is, will aid us in moving away from any kind of methodical worship or familiarity. So I take you to the altar. The brazen altar, as we used to say in the old language. The bronze altar was in the outer court before the tabernacle tent. This is the place where the burnt offering of the Lord was offered. The Hebrew word for altar is a place of sacrifice. So we use a kind of an archaic English word, but they would, if the Hebrews would have understood, oh, you're talking about place of sacrifice. Place of sacrifice is where I go and sacrifice the burnt offering before the Lord. Well, let's consider this then in Psalm 43, verses 3 through 5. And the psalmist sings out, Send out your light and your truth, and let them, that's the light and the truth, lead me. Let them bring me to where? Your holy hill and to your dwelling. Remember, the tabernacle being up on a hill, the temple being up on a hill. Then I will go to the altar of God. If, this is, if you're a highlighter, highlight this. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lie, oh God, my God. And then he bleeds into the reason why he's singing this song. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. What is the cure for this? Going to the altar. I'm going to go to the altar. God, let your light and your truth, your word, the light, true light that comes from heaven, lead me to where? To your holy presence. There at the altar of God, I will go to God, my exceeding joy. Send your light, Lord. Lead me to the hill that you, that, where you live amongst your people. Then I will go. There is the altar. Where does this psalmist go to meet with his exceeding joy, the treasure in God, the treasure of the heaven, of the kingdom of heaven, this heavenly place to meet with God? It's the altar. Well, in this, I think this will help us uh, with clarity. In Leviticus 9, 22 through 24, reads this, Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. So there's the altar. He's leaving the altar. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Uh, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when they, all the people saw it, they shouted, and then they fell on their faces. Now that, that's the cure before methodical ritual familiar worship. You know, it would be a sight to behold to watch fire come out from the presence of the Lord to consume this offering. But there they are. They're at this altar. And fire from the presence of God, a fire which was to be kept at all time, consumed the offering that was there on the bronze altar. And this was a pleasing aroma, God said, to his nostrils, allowing the sinner to approach. The ashes from the offering burnt by the fire of the Lord's presence was to be covered in a purple cloth. Horns projected off the four corners of the altar, which was covered with blood once a year at Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, as we say. As the Lord said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, and there is no approach to a holy God. The place of atonement before God's face that is upon this bronze altar made real reconciliation between a holy God and a sinner approaching as heaven and the God of heaven as at a meeting place on earth. Sin upon the animal consumed by God's holy hot fire. And by the shedding of blood in this very gory scene, the sinner is forgiven and beckoned to approach. This shadow of things to come leads us to where? It's to the cross. The place of atonement before the face of God was on a holy hill named the skull. But it was a place of Roman execution. The perfect Christ became a curse for us as he hanged on a tree. Forsaken by God, Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us. 
by the shedding of his blood in this very gory scene being flogged by by roman soldiers this perfect sacrifice was covered in a purple robe and crowned a king with a crown of thorns the place of the royal court of heaven upon earth and the coronation of earth's king from heaven the high priest offering the perfect sacrifice before the face of god became the perfect sacrifice to make the make right the sinner how do we become right with god how can we approach god it is through this complex and this complex is a shadow of christ the this uh, Truly, now all who enter through this sacrifice on the altar of the Lord and passing through the torn veil and into the holy presence of God, into the holy of holies, is welcomed and truly forgiven. It is a real and an everlasting reconciliation. There is a lot of detail here, isn't there? I mean, I debated about how much I wanted to go into because there's so much and it is rich. But before you get in the lost and the wonder of it all, I want you to get the point. Do not doubt God's provision to welcome you to himself. The, this King Jesus suffered, becoming the suffering servant, the true and perfect sacrifice. Why? Because he loves you. He loves his people. Do not doubt that all God required of us to enjoy a relationship with, us, with him and be made right, Christ provides by grace and by grace alone. Have you ever seen, um, you know, a movie, or maybe you've actually seen uh, one of the royal banquets uh, that surrounds the king or queen of England on TV? Um, they even still do it today. It's a tradition. It met, had a lot more meaning back in medieval times. When nobles would be coming in, they would be introduced um, uh, in, into the party before the monarch. Their name and title is given. Uh, this one, uh, Sir Christopher Yelverton of North Ampershire, Earl of Arundel, Earl of Sussex. Okay, so you get the name, you get where they're from, and you get what, what their title is. Here's the lands they own, here's the taxes they collected, but also, very importantly, he's not a commoner. Who's approaching the monarch at this party? You don't see commoners. If you see them, they're dressed to the nines, and they're there for one purpose, serving the nobles. <laughs> That's what they're there for. Well, what about us? Because let's face it, we're peasants. I mean, unless you're wealthy, it's good to meet you. But most of us, we're peasants. We're commoners. So we hear this word. You see a servant approaching the king. He's on his throne surrounded by nobles and massive guards and this amazing array and high see the big throne all the purple all the scarlet all the red and all the wonderful trappings gold couplings and silver and bronze shows the wealth and power of this monarch and the servant leans down my lord a commoner asks for your royal company to ask for the king's company could be very well be inviting danger uh, to ask for his majesty's royal ear to listen to your complaints and to listen to your, any grievances you have in his kingdom as a mere commoner was not just rare, but very, very dangerous. So how could I dare walk past the 20 pillars, past the bronze altar, past the table and the bread of the presence, through the veil and into the royal court of the king and ask for his ear. I am worse than a commoner. I'm a sinner. It makes me not just a commoner, but an enemy. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. What was I? When, I, when Christ suffered once for all my sin, what was I? The righteousness of God for an unrighteous man as, as I am. What was I when Christ made perfect atonement on the altar of the Lord upon the cross that he might bring me to God forever? When I was still an enemy, Christ died for me. 
The crucified, humiliated Christ took the torture and the death willingly. He is now exalted, having risen to be at the right hand of the Father. His name is above every name. His knee, or every knee, will bow before him. And what is this? Where is this perfect tabernacle now? This dwelling place of God with men. This heavenly place. This heavenly place is at the right hand of the Father. The God who spoke to Job from a terrifying whirlwind is the Word become flesh in Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve as high priest, but also through his flesh and blood. We walk through the court, past the altar, into the Holy of Holies, and we meet with God. Why Christ, by his light and his truth, have brought us? How heavenly. And none of these ancient people got to God through, but through this tabernacle. Not the Egyptians and all their wonder and religious rituals and rich history. They did not meet with God. Not in the way that we would want to. Not the Hittites, Hindus, Buddhists. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. I am the way of the pillars and past the altar and into the Holy of Holies. I am the only way. God makes the way, the only way to him, and he who lives in the heavens has made a place to meet with sinners, which is heavenly. And the place is in Jesus Christ alone. But we, as expert idol makers, or sinners, if you want to call us by another word, we like to pretend that we can define that which is heavenly. You choose to meet with God in ways that works for you, and I'll meet in way, God in ways that works for me. What people do with Christianity is make a version of Jesus and his teachings that best fits their fancies. It is why so many evangelicals know very little theology. Doctrine, that is what the Bible teaches, is not as important, not as weighty, as maybe our political posture or our philosophical opinion. And yet, imagine, if you will, some Hebrew setting up a very large tent right next to the tabernacle of God. You go to the complex, and right next to her, there's this other tent. And each land, each village, the wandering Exodus generation passes. He sets up his tent right there by the tabernacle so people can come into, into his tent and just listen to him rant and rave about how evil the people were in those towns. Have you seen what these pagans are up to these days? Man, that really gets my, on my nerves. It should get on yours too. Oh, he says, I'm mad, and you should be. That seems rather silly, doesn't it? In fact, I would say downright irreverent because this is right before the face of the holy God. And yet so many American Christians are doing just that. Oh, I could go into the majestic presence of God in faith to my exceeding joy to treasure God. Or I could go to this tent over here and listen to the anger and rants of all these passing pagan villages. Oh, I can go on and on about their opinions. But I don't really care to hear about what these fleeting, passing kingdoms, which will one day stoop to the most humiliating of all kingdoms as a footstool to my Christ. They are going under his feet. So I don't get so upset because we're wandering into this wilderness on our way to the promised land. We are marching to Zion. We are going to the kingdom of heaven that is like treasure hidden in a field. I'm not so upset about all these pagans. I'm not so upset about these passing villages. What upsets me is that they're in darkness and they need to see a great light. Because we're on a final exodus. And we're being led by Christ. The early Christians, our forefathers, got this. They didn't look to Rome or for an earthly spot that is heavenly. No. They were looking by faith for a city yet to come. Where God, and God alone, is the architect and builder. Architect of his own glorious throne room, banquet table of the king. Builder of a new heaven and a new earth where Christ upon David's thro throne forever is ruling with an everlasting peace. You see, the spiritual man has taken off the clothes of selfishness and surrendering and selling all the luxuries that are demanded to be treated right. And he's put on what? Clothes of humility, kindness, peacefulness, gentleness that takes the pains of wilderness travel 
and it endures the pains of persecution from an unbelieving world. But he takes it all like a blessed man, a happy man. Why would someone sell everything and purchase that field? Oh, says the man, with only a deed in his hand. I have a sneaking suspicion about this land. Not a prospector or anything, but I just I got a hunch that this is going to be something extraordinary hidden in this field. Beyond your wildest imaginations is this treasure. So what does this king say? This king on the throne, surrounded by this gloriousness, all striking for everyone who approaches, what does he say? Let the children come to me. That is the words of King Jesus. Do not hinder them, for to such children belongs the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, come to Jesus like children. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Beloved, come to Jesus burdened and tired. Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Are you burdened, frustrated by an angry, evil world? Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Run and do not walk. Run to your soul's exceeding joy. This heavenly place of meeting with God through Christ. He has poured out his blood on the altar of the Lord. He has torn the veil. You are now welcomed in, not as a sinner, but as a righteous man, not as a commoner. For when your name is announced before the throne room of God, this one belongs to Christ. Not as an enemy, but as a friend, as an adopted child of God. He will listen to you. He will comfort you. He is the very present help in times of trouble. He is strength for your weakness, for the childlike, the weary, the hurting, the humble, the weak, the downcast. We enter in claiming the righteousness of our own. I have nothing but Christ's righteousness, his sacrifice. I run now to God my exceeding joy. And this is yours, and he is your God, and we are his people. All of this in Christ and in Christ alone.